Good morning. Good morning, everyone. I am grateful to have a few minutes to spend with you as we continue our One Another series. Speaking of one another, uh, there are several uh, opportunities you will have, if you want to, to uh, see some great things that have happened in our church family that have been talked about uh, in more public ways that have made their way uh, into to news outlets. So, uh, first of all, uh, former staff members here and missionaries and residents who spent some time in Mombasa, Kenya, uh, Pat and Ken Beckloff, who are uh, now retired, are featured on a Netflix episode of the show The Kindness Diaries. That is season two, episode six. The premise of the show, I think, I've only seen their clip, is that a very wealthy man has decided to travel around the world relying only on the kindness of others, not disclosing his full identity. And then when he receives kindness, he blesses people in return. And so if you want to go see some friends of ours who who are shining lights for the cause of Christ, go watch The Kindness Diaries, uh, Season 2, Episode 6. The second thing, thanks to our uh, friend Eric Trigestad of the Christian Chronicle, uh, we, uh, you can go read the story of our church family a few weeks ago who went to the Oklahoma City Blue game and supported our friend and fellow member Kevin Hervey. There's some great uh, quotes in that story. Uh, reminds us of the power of encouragement, which we'll talk about in a minute. And then third, our preacher made some folks smart speakers order toilet paper. And again, thanks to Eric and his writing, but then it has been picked up by multiple outlets. It was a small part of uh, an NPR show, they mentioned it, Dave Barry's blog. It's all over the place. And both Eric and Phil have lamented that out of all the work they have done over the years, this is the thing that has gotten picked up and spread. Nevertheless, it's it's a funny story, and uh, I'm I'm grateful to read about our friends and family members who are uh, making an impact in the world in both serious and humorous ways. Well, I want to talk this morning about encouragement, and I want to start with a tale of two yearbook signatures in my history. I've mentioned this a little in the past uh, because it was formative for me, both in good and bad ways. So here's a page, first, of my 1993 uh, yearbook. There's, you can see, the typical don't ever change, stay true, all the stuff Uh, that you write when you're in fifth grade and have no idea what to do. But let's zoom in on the uh, quote in the middle there. Let's throw that up on the screen. I want you to read that for a minute. (laughs) Yep. You're having trouble with that. It says, don't pull your pants up so far. (laughs) Written by a guy named Robbie. Now, to be fair, uh, Robbie had a point. I look back at photos. He wasn't entirely wrong. But who writes that in a yearbook? (laughs) Like, who thinks that's a good way to leave someone at the end of the year with that quote? That's 1993, 26 years later, I still remember that. I don't harbor a grudge anymore because I think it's funny, but that was formative for me. Caused some fashion uh, anxiety on my part. But here's another one from 1998, the end of my sophomore year, written by the, one of the coolest guys in school named Graham Wilkinson, who is now in Austin, Texas, a singer-songwriter. And he's, he was a senior writing to me, a sophomore. And he says, say, brother, I'm glad I got to know you this year. I've also enjoyed playing the guitar with you. Thanks for teaching me some DMB songs. That's Dave Matthews Band, for those of you who don't know me well. Keep playing the guitar and always believe in yourself no matter what you do. Never give up hope. And then after his signature, he writes this quote, And I'll know my song well before I start singing. He puts dub below it because he thought I was cool enough to get the Bob Dylan reference. That was pretty neat. I still remember that a couple of decades later. So writer John Maxwell talks about the elevator principle. We might imagine just the up and down buttons on an elevator. Some people in life bring us down, and we just tolerate them. Some people add something to life, and we enjoy them. There was a story told about a woman who went on a date two nights in a row. One night was with Uh, British Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli. The next night was with his rival, William Gladstone. And after the two successive dates, she was asked what she thought. And she said this, 
Well, when I left the dining room after sitting next to Mr. Gladstone, I thought he was the cleverest man in England. But after sitting next to Mr. Disraeli, I thought I was the cleverest woman in England. And, and you could read that as an insult to his intelligence, but what she meant was he made me feel good about myself. I spent an hour with this important person, and I came away feeling really good about myself. So I want to talk today about the power of encouraging one another. And I want to do that by pointing us to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23 through 25. This is what the Hebrew writer says to an audience, to some readers who are growing discouraged. Life is getting hard. They are not sure about their faith. They don't know how to go on or even if they should go on. And it's beginning to affect their behavior. And he says this, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we professed, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. So he urges them in this passage not to, to give up hope, and not to abandon their assemblies. Don't stop meeting together. Some of us are more familiar with this from the King James Version, which says, do not forsake the assembly of the saints. And I remember hearing that a lot as a kid um, as a reason that I needed to go to church. And I was, I was grateful for formative years that taught me the importance of that. But sometimes I was unclear why. What am I supposed to be there for? So I want you to notice in this verse how the writer sets two things in opposition. He says, don't give up meeting together, but encourage one another. In other words, the opposite of skipping church is encouraging one another. It's not the opposite of skipping church is being here. The opposite of skipping church is encouraging one another. Our gatherings are vertical. They are between us and God, but they are also horizontal. They are between one another. And you being here is an encouragement to others. The opposite of skipping church is encouraging one another. I want to spend our time this morning looking at two facets of that. One is who, so who should we encourage? The other is how, and I'm going to give you some practical tips if you think, I want to be more encouraging, and I'm not sure how to do it, I want to give you some takeaways. So first, let's talk about the who. Okay? who whom should we encourage? Here's the obvious answer. People who are discouraged. Let's start there. Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 5.14, he tells us to warn those who are idle and disruptive, encourage the disheartened, help the weak, and be patient with everyone. That's what he writes to a group of believers. So he says, encourage the disheartened. We wonder who that might be. So I thought through some, and it's just from my perspective. You would have more. I'm sure you would want to add to this list. But when I think of people who are disheartened, here are some of the groups of folks I think of. I think of those who are doubting. I think of those whose health or health of a loved one is worrisome. I think of those who are single and wish to be married, or those who have no children who wish they did. I think of those parents whose kids are making difficult choices and causing the family anxiety. I think of those whose marriage is barely hanging on, those who are lonely, those who have caused themselves or their families embarrassment or shame, and those who feel like they're a failure. It's anyone who needs someone to remind them not to give up hope. And you would have more to add to that list. We are to encourage the disheartened. Encouraging the disheartened is so important that we find missionaries in the New Testament who were sent, whose job it was to encourage others. So from prison, Paul knew that believers were worried about him and so we find this in Ephesians chapter 6. He says, Tychicus, the dear brother and faithful servant in the Lord, will tell you everything so that you also may know how I am and what I'm doing. 
I'm sending him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage you. Or in Colossians, a similar passage, Tychicus will tell you all the news about me. He's a dear brother, a fellow minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I'm sending him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. And finally, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, we read about Timothy, whom Paul says is our brother and co-worker in God's service in spreading the gospel of Christ. He is sent to strengthen and encourage you in your faith. We have people who were sent to encourage. People whom Paul knew were disheartened. And he said, I'm sending this person to you and one of their main jobs is just to encourage you. And I'm reminded of teams we send to the mission field whose job it is, among a few things, I suspect, is to encourage our missionaries and to remind them that what they are doing is important. So the most obvious people we would encourage are those who are disheartened, those who are discouraged. But we also need to encourage those people who are being courageous already, those who are doing bold things at great risk. So when God's people in the Old Testament are about to take the land He's promised them, some of them are scared, but some of, our, some of them are bold and ready to do it. Joshua is one of them. He is ready to do it. And even still, read what God says to him in the first chapter of Joshua. He says, Be strong and courageous, because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Have I not commanded you, He says later on, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So here's a guy, Joshua, who's being brave in his leadership, but he needed to be reminded that he was doing the right thing and that God was with him. Part of our job might be to look for those who are taking bold steps, who are taking risks for a good reason and to encourage them to stay the course. So recently, a preacher I knew from my hometown preached a very bold sermon about racism. It was biblical, it was spot on, and it was needed. But when you talk about those things, it's going to be difficult. You're going to hear voices saying you shouldn't talk about that, or that's not a gospel concern, or that you're too hard on uh, people. And I knew he was going to hear those kinds of things, and so I made sure... And write him a note and said, you're doing the right thing. Keep it up. You did exactly what you needed to do in that moment. Or a friend of mine who is the leader of an organization, who is leading that organization through some very difficult but important waters. And I made sure and tell this person, you are doing the right thing. I know you may be hearing voices telling you you are not, but you are doing the right thing. Or there was a civic leader recently who made some visionary statements And I thought, this person needs to be reminded that that they're doing the right thing because I know they're hearing voices saying you're not. So when you step out on a limb, you need people to remind you that it's not going to break or that if it does break, they're going to be there to catch you. So in addition to encouraging the discouraged, sometimes we need to encourage those who are being bold, who are showing courage, who we know are taking incoming fire to say, stick with it. You're doing the right thing. Do not give up. Do not back down. So those are two broad categories of the who. And again, I know you would think of more. Let's get practical and talk about the how for a minute. Let's talk about the how. We're going to work backwards from the obvious. Okay, the first how, I would say, is just to speak up. Speak up. Paul says several times in his letters, in 1 Thessalonians, he says, encourage one another. And build each other up. Or in 2 Corinthians, he says, strive for full restoration. Encourage one another. Here's what I want you to know. It's a bold move to speak up and encourage people. For some of you, it's way outside of your comfort zone. But I want you to know, rather than thinking that you won't do anyone any good, I want you to speak up. And Rather than thinking that other people will do the encouraging, Speak up. Rather than staying silent because it is safer, speak up. 
you may be countering dozens of negative messages that someone is hearing. It's a bold move to speak up. And I, I understand that speaking up might not, for all of us, be in a public way. It might not even be speaking. It might be writing. But it's a bold move to use your words to encourage someone else, especially if it's outside of your comfort zone. So the most obvious step we want to do, if we want to encourage people, is to find times and speak up. Say something. But if we work backwards from the speaking part, maybe another thing we would want to do is just to show up. If you remember the Hebrews passage, the writer says that assembling together is an encouragement. Now, there are things that we do in the assembly that's an encouragement to one another. Singing, we're told, is an encouragement to one another. We're teaching each other and encouraging. But just showing up is an important step. I've been really thankful uh, for people who have reminded me of the importance of showing up. So Mark Brewer often uses the phrase, always go to the funeral. And he tries to live by that mantra. Um, that phrase is uh, sourced from an essay and an audio uh, presentation from NPR. You can go and listen to that. I've set up uh, just a real simple web page uh, on our website, mrcc.org slash encourage. If you're interested in reading or listening to the whole thing, you ought to go do that. But it's by a writer who remembers a time in her childhood when her parents lived by that phrase. And so they forced her to go to the funeral of one of her teachers. This is when she was in elementary school. And she didn't know what to do, and she felt awkward, and she just sat there. But she says even to this day, and she's now an adult, the parents of that young teacher tear up when they see her and give her a hug and tell her, thank you for being there. That her showing up, even though she had no idea what to do and felt uncomfortable, was important to them. I still remember the funeral of my grandfather in the fall of 2000. It was my freshman year of college. I came home for that. Um, we were in a, an unfamiliar church building in Iowa Park, Texas. And I didn't know many people there. It was my grandfather's home church. And I remember walking, you know, when the family comes in, I remember walking down the aisle, and I remember seeing the elders from the Faith Village Church of Christ where I grew up lining the aisles. I can close my eyes, and I can tell you where they were sitting. That was important to me. These are the people I know who are here in a really hard time, and I feel out of place, and I don't know what to do with myself, and I don't know any of these people, and here are the folks I know who are standing there. They didn't talk to me that day. I didn't have a chance to visit with them. But that was important to me. They just showed up. And look, here's the thing. Let's be honest for a minute. Going to a funeral is sometimes an inconvenience, isn't it? It is. Listen, I'm not the best about it, and my commute is a lot quicker than any of yours. Okay? And I have reminded myself that it's important. And I know some of us have jobs and things where getting away during the workday just isn't going to work. I'm not talking about, I don't want to get too specific about how we apply this. I'm just saying that sometimes encouraging others and showing up is an inconvenience. And I love what Stanley Hauerwas says about this. About, uh, he, he makes a convicting statement about Christians. He says, we're, we're okay with dying for Christ, but we'd rather just not be inconvenienced. That sometimes being an encouragement means adjusting our schedule and showing up. And it's not just funerals. There are other important events to be at. Maybe it's Senior Sunday when we honor our graduates. Maybe it's baby dedication when we pray for and honor our families with new children. Maybe it's when our sixth grade boys and girls lead their respective worships and classes each year. Maybe it's a sports event or a performance or something else of a child that you know. Maybe in your small group. Your presence means more than you'll ever know. People remember that. Even if you don't get a chance to interact with the person, show up. We are going to show up at funerals, at important church family events. And of course, we're going to show up when people are in distress. When there's something hard going on. I remember... Uh, back when I worked at the church in Yukon, we had a, a member who most people knew who was having a very difficult surgery. 
And so many of us showed up at the waiting room at Mercy Hospital, and it, was almost, it almost turned into a party that I think they almost kicked us out. Uh, and because this was the kind of personality this person had. It was a joyous time. Um, we were all there praying, but we got together. We, we showed up. It was a big event for this family. And we got there. There are things that you can think of where you would make a huge difference if you would show up in person. And in an age when we feel very disconnected, showing up in person is a big sacrifice and means a lot. So we're going to speak up, we're going to set up, and finally, uh, we're going to set up. Sometimes this requires preparation, okay? So some people are natural at this. Like they can just walk in a room and they've got it covered. Some of us need to plan a little bit, okay? Some of us have to think it through. So for instance, if you want to start writing people notes, get some cards and get some stamps and have them ready all the time. I have learned from David Allen and his getting things done method that if there's multiple steps between me and getting something done, I'm going to not do it. And so if one of the excuses is, oh man, I've got to find a time to go to the post office and get this stuff, you're not going to do it. If you have stacks of cards, if you have stamps, if you have phone numbers of people ready, that's one thing you're removing. Okay? Maybe you need to, on Sunday, imagine what your day is like and plan your interactions. Okay? So maybe you need to remember who's, who you're going to see and plan what you might say to them. Maybe you scan social media for important moments and you send people a note. Maybe you need to get plugged into a Bible class or a Q group or both. Okay? So both those things are important ways in our church family when we encourage one another. It's not just in this room. In fact, this room, it's hard to do that. But if you're in a smaller setting to interact with people, that is a great way to encourage people. So if your takeaway from this is that you want to be more encouraging, I, I would ask that you go to our website that I've set up, mrcc.org slash encourage. You can listen to that, that presentation on Always Go to the Funeral. You can listen to an interview we did a while back that our own Shelley Eisen conducted with Robert Hamm, who is one of the most encouraging people I know. And she talked to him about that as part of an interview series we did on the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, there are links to see our classes and our small groups and get plugged in. There are 12 quick ideas that I put down. Didn't take too long on it. Just 12 ideas to encourage people. Okay. So here's the quote I want you to think about as we leave. Uh, Larry Crabb says that encouragement is the kind of expression that helps someone want to be a better Christian even when life is rough. Listen, folks, there are people in this room who have not heard an encouraging word all week. They haven't heard it at their job. They haven't heard it at school. They haven't heard it at home. If they can't get it here, then what are we doing? There are people who just need you to say an encouraging word. It doesn't have to be profound. It doesn't have to be deep. It doesn't have to be this momentous occasion. They just need someone to remind them not to give up hope. That's on us. And if you need an encouraging word today, I will leave you with this. And after this closing, which I'm going to take from the very end of the book of Jude, that we're wrapping up in our Bible classes, if you need encouragement today, we want you to come forward and let us encourage you. If you need to become a Christian today, if you need to be baptized, we want you to come forward and let us do that for you. We would love to do that, and what an encouragement it would be for others to see that. So let me leave you with this closing from Jude, and then after that, we'll stand and sing. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. If we can serve you in any way, please come while we stand and sing.